the kick and pitch. In the air, right field. That one back, gone. Walk it off. And Morrell is the hero here tonight as he sprints around the bases. <laughs> oh my, what a moment for Christopher Morrell. What a great call by Boog Shiambi on Christopher Morrell's walk-off home run in the Crosstown Classic. Probably a moment that will be play replayed throughout Cl Crosstown Classics for, for years to come. You're listening to the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust, proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs and exclusive home of Cubs Checking. Open online today at Wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. And as a reminder, we're available on all podcast platforms, so be sure to rate and subscribe. Andy Martinez here joined by Tim Stebbins, Marquee Sports Network contributor. Tim we're recording, I I don't know the time, but not too long after the Morrell home run. That was that was insane. That's probably the loudest Wrigley's been this year. Yeah, I mean, there's been some 40,000-plus uh, attendance games, I think, in the last few years um, since the, the year with no fans, obviously. But you know there's there's been some, but that's not consistently every game, right? And right. this one is not only that, 40,300 and some. But you have the dueling White Sox and Cubs fans, right? Like, yeah. I think it was the eighth inning where the White Sox had it loaded the bases with nobody out. And, yep. you know, let's go White Sox is breaking out. It wasn't just like you see visiting teams coming to Wrigley and that happened. Right, like you have a couple, you like you have like 10, 20 people chanting it. It was loud. Right. And then what happened was, as we'll get into later, the Cubs got out of it unscathed in that spot in the eighth inning. Uh, of course, loud. And then, you know, Cubs fans are, you know, the majority. I think there's more Cubs fans there than Sox fans, if I had guess. I had right. to guess, and Christopher Morrell uh, absolutely clobbers a baseball that was just probably one of the best wins for the Cubs, I think, this year, just considering where they're on the standings and where they were in that point in the game. Right, and I think the, the coolest thing for me was seeing just the pure emotion and joy of Christopher Morrell in that moment, right? We talk so much about how much joy he plays with, how excited he is whenever he's on the on the field and, and what he does. Uh, everything, it seems like it's it's magic or, or he's just like a kid playing in, in the backyard when he's when he's out there. And that's what that celebration was, right? It was super cool just to see him. I mean, he knew he got it right away, right? And I think from our vantage point in the press box, you can correct me if you're wrong, but it looked like it had a chance for sure, but it looked like it could hit off the wall and maybe be a double or, or something. Like it, did, it wasn't for sure a, a home run from from our vantage point. Morel, though, he knew right away. Like that's that thing is gone. That that's out of there. And he's celebrating. He's jumping up and down around, and he, he's celebrating. And he gets around third base, and he takes his own shirt off. And <laughs> after the game, we asked him like, what like what what went into the taking off the shirt? And he's like, I don't even remember. I don't know why I did it. I just I just did it. I don't remember doing it. I don't remember running around the bases. Like he was just on cloud nine, and he was asked like, is that the biggest moment of your baseball career? He's like, yeah. Like the debut was really high. I remember he had a home run in his in his debut his major league debut, but this clearly topped it, just given, like you mentioned, the circumstances around the game, what it was. And then the helmet toss, I forgot about the helmet toss. I There might be a chance his helmet went just as far as the home run ball. Yeah, uh, he broke StatCast on the home run ball. Literally. We know that, or StatCast didn't pick up uh, you know, the distance or anything, the yeah. exit velocity, but I guess this is one of those moments where we could just say the exit velocity was crushed. Yes, and it was enough. The launch angle, enough. But that's right. what you're talking about, though, right. where... He hit that ball, and it was such a, a low, a low line drive to the opposite field, nonetheless. Yeah. That it's not one of those, you know, left field bleacher home runs that you see from righties at Wrigley all the time, where you know it has enough juice. When he's right. going the other way like that, it's got to have a little bit more oomph to get out, and it had enough. And, yeah, and that's really all that mattered. But I wish we could see some of those numbers. Uh, maybe they'll they'll get them at some point. I don't know. But exit velocity, man, like the ball was scorched, and at least you knew it was gonna probably tie the game, if not, you know one run at least in that spot two runs and one thing that was interesting and and he mentioned it after the game right yesterday or excuse me tuesday night's game against the white Sox, they lose gregory santos picks up the save but leaves with uh, an inning and two thirds for him in the save leading off the ninth inning a two-run ball game christopher Morales up to bat to lead off the inning he strikes out on three pitches looked over a little overmatched against gregory santos and after the game Morales talking about he that was in the back of his mind and i asked him after the game like i said what did you know about Gregory Santos from that first at bat that you took into the second at bat? And he his his words were, he, he's a guy that throws really really hard, right? So he's gonna he's gonna attack you with some really good stuff. He's got a hundred mile an hour sinker, 
And for him, it was just about just trying to keep it simple, especially when he got to the two strike approach. It was keep it simple, put the ball in play, and and you give your chance with Cody. You you give yourself a chance with Cody Bellinger at second base to come around and score and then keep the pressure on the Cubs. He did a little bit more than just put the ball in play, right? He he hit it out of the ballpark and, and it was great. And his line after the game was was pretty great. He said yesterday he struck me out. It's my time. It's my time. Like th- this time it was his time to to get revenge. He got revenge and, and it was huge for the Cubs. Yeah, I mean, I went on the other side, uh, the White Sox reaction and covering them for MLB.com. And what I would say is Santos, like you're saying, the sinker averages 99 miles an hour. Uh, he had given up with the slider, on the other hand, one extra base hit all year, and people were hitting 182 against it. And he said after the game, uh, I wish I had thrown a slider there. I mean, I'm yeah. paraphrasing, but he said, like, I would have thrown the slider there if I had a do-over. Um, Pedro Grafal was on, he was, he would kind of said otherwise. He said it's really more just about conviction in what you're throwing and execution. Sure. And I think that's the simplest thing there. It's Morel capitalized on a mistake. I mean, yeah. he, in the, the second pitch of that bat, he swung and chased the sl- uh, slider down in a way. The next pitch, Santos tried to get him to chase it again. Morel, that's the maturity I think you've seen from him this yeah. year. He, he laid off that 0-2 slider outside down in a way. And then when, when Santos came back with a sinker, as you're saying, like, you know, he throws hard, but he left it right over the middle. Morel's not going to miss those. And, right, and right, that's right. what we've seen all season from him. Yeah, and that, that's the thing is, like, last year, especially, like, the last month or two of the season when he was really, really struggling, it seemed like if you got to 0-2, if you were a pitcher, you felt pretty good, right? Like, you know, you could get him with a slinker, a sinker, a slider down and away, a sinker uh, on the outside corner. Like, you knew that there were certain ways to attack him that you could just get him out. And for for Morel, it was it – was, I mean, it was evident. You look up the numbers in the second, last two months, he was not the same player when he first came up. And that was part of the reason – the Cubs decided to start him in Triple A Iowa. Now, like, if you want to get into the the argument of like whether or not that was the right decision, you don't know. But he, since he's come up, he's been that impactful bat, and he hasn't really had that extended uh, downtime. Right? He's had his lulls. He's had his valleys where he struggled. That's expected, right? Everyone has that. Even Cody Bellinger, who's been red hot, has been has had his moments where he struggled. Christopher Morales' moments where he struggled, but he's not had those valleys as low. And as long as as they were last year, where last year the last two months were really struggling. This year, he's been a pretty consistent player, and really like with him, Bellinger, Jamer Candelario, Danzy Swanson, like that lineup is very deep, right? Like Seiya Suzuki hitting eighth is kind of in, insane. Just given like Tuesday night, he has the home run, and he he has the power to to be able to to change the game. Like having Christopher Morel in that middle of the lineup really turns things over and and really sets the stage for for the offense. And, and that showed in, in, in a clutch situation. And also, I, I don't want to forget just how clutch he is in the ninth inning, right? Like, we, I think you and I have had that – we've had a discussion. We even had it with Dexter Fowler earlier in the season about, <laughs> like, is clutch a thing or not, right? Christopher Merrill in the ninth inning, 27 at-bats this season, 10 hits, 4 home runs, 11 RBI, 1282 OPS. That I mean, it's you, you'd have to look up every single situation, whether how, like how what the score was and everything. But in the ninth inning, you know, you, there's not a guy you want more than Christopher Morel up in, in that situation. And when he gets a mistake, that's that's exactly what you're looking for. Well, I'll give you another one. I mean, it was against Toronto on Saturday. It was yeah four four game, and and Christopher Morel came up and and hit a double that put the Cubs ahead, and that was the winning winning hit in right. the top of the ninth there. Um, I think, like like we're saying, he hasn't had the lulls, I think, last year. Like, there's deep struggles, I think, in the second half. He, he's kind of been scuffling lately. Like, yeah. look, if you look at the numbers the last 7, 15 games, he's, he's been down. But I think the whole point in what we're saying is, is this moment that you saw, the one in Toronto, that's always in there with him. Right. You know that he is capable of that. And what he's shown this year is he is – you see it more because yep. we're talking about these lulls that are not as deep, these, these, these peaks and valleys, like – even when he's struggling, he's been, I think, there's been these moments, and, and this is just kind of another example there uh, in that spot. I mean, and you're talking about Lincoln, Lincoln in the lineup. I mean, what is he hitting sixth tonight, right? Yeah. Like, that's that's pretty good to have that kind of power out of the sixth spot for a right. team that I think part, for part of the season has been looking for more power. And, and you were saying the Candelario trade, and Suzuki's been bumped down, but he's kind of showed some signs lately. Like, to have that there, like I think this that's that bodes well for this team. Yeah, and, and that's that's one of, that was one of the big question marks going into the season, right? Where is this power gonna come from, right? There's there's some on base possibility, there's the the defense, there's starting pitching and, and the bullpen we figured they would kind of figure it out. It was the the question was always where's the power gonna come from? Now it seems like the the power you you kinda have a good base between Bellinger, half starting to hit home runs. He has as many home runs in, since after the all star break as he did before the all star break and a lot fewer at bats. So you're starting to see a little bit more pop 
coming out. But you touched on it a little bit earlier. The the Toronto win was big. They end the series in Toronto with the with a tough loss uh, to to take two or three in Toronto, three and three road trip with the Mets and, and Blue Jays. Then they lose the first game after a day off against the White Sox, and they're staring at a three nothing loss where the offense for was was kind of shut down by Mike Clevenger, and there was it was going into a three uh, uh, a three game losing streak where this was a, a a stretch in the schedule where you got the White Sox. The Royals, the Tigers, like this was a stretch that you felt like the Cubs could make up some ground. It would have been a really, really different outlook if Christopher Morel doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, look, like let's just let's just be honest here. This is a stretch they should take advantage of their schedule, right? Yeah. Like entering this the series opener against the White Sox, those twelve games that we're talking about with the the Royals, the White Sox, Royals, Tigers, Pirates. Those teams have a combined four hundred three winning percentage entering right. that series. And it's not only just that; it's like you know. I think that some of these guys talked about it, like Kyle Hendricks, Dansby Swanson. Like, it is true. You cannot overlook teams no. in, in the big leagues. They are still big leaguers in any given day, especially over a six-month, 162-game season. Teams teams win. Like, it's right. just you can't overlook people. Um, but to me, it's not just who the Cubs are playing that is why this stretch is a bit opportunistic. It's who the Brewers are playing, the team yeah. you're chasing. You know, the Brewers had the Dodgers. What are they doing? They're leading the NL West. And after the Dodgers, they go to the visit the Rangers, who lead the AL West. And then, you know, AL Central is not a, not the strongest division this year, but then they go play the Twins, who are leading the Central. Padres have had an up-and-down year. Point being, though, those four teams, that's, that's the next... Well, the Cubs are playing these four teams. The Brewers are playing those four. Those teams had a 547 winning percentage entering Tuesday. And what's happened? The Brewers, the Brewers are, I think... I, you respect the Brewers; they're a good team, but they've dropped those first two to the Dodgers. So that's what you talk about with this opportunity. It's who you're playing versus who other teams are playing. Even if the Brewers go five and five in that, you probably put, you probably would think the Cubs can go better than you know six and right. six against their strict schedule. So, uh, like you're saying, if they had gone into back to back against the White Sox, like losing those, that's that's that'd be a tough tough thing, I think. And and that is you touched on an important thing, right? Like anyone can beat anyone. The Oakland A's are really struggling, uh, worst team in baseball, and and. There's a lot of, there's a lot going on with that team. The Cubs swept them, took three games out of them. They swept the Brewers in Milwaukee. They Beat took the Cardinals they, they, nothing. Yeah, they split the they split with the Rays. Like on any given day, anyone can beat anyone. And and the, that we saw that on Tuesday, right, where the the Cubs played a pretty, I don't want to say like really good game, but they played a, a clean game and they had they were in a situation where they could have won that game. They were in the game, yeah. Right, and and, and the White Sox had some really good defensive plays. Got some some luck with the, the. I feel like they got some bad bit luck and, and were able to take advantage and, and 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 chase Kyle Hendricks out of the game and 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 win that game. That's what has to happen. Is you have to come in like, even though you're looking at the Royals last place in the AL Central, like it would be like, all right, they, these are three easy games. Like they, they Cubs can't afford to look at it that way because as we've seen, like any team can beat any team, and I think that's the most important thing. Going back on to Wednesday night's game against the White Sox, the the finale, the Cubs take the three one series against the uh, against the White Sox this year. There was other moments besides the Morrell home run that I thought were were really key for me. Mm-hmm. I think the big one that is was huge was the Michael Fulmer striking out the side. That was a situation where it's bases loaded, no outs. Jose Quas, who's been really solid, comes in and struggles, hit two walks, and, and the bases are loaded. And it's the middle of the White Sox lineup. Things were looking bleak for the Cubs right there. Yeah, I mean, look, like Pedro Grafal talked about it. He talked about how, you know, they didn't put the ball in play, the White yeah. Sox. They struck out three straight times, and the Cubs infield was back. So basically, when you're having the infield back, you're playing to give up a run for ideally a double play, which yeah. would have put the Cubs down an extra run. And then you're talking about this morale moment. That that might not mean as much, or it might not. The right. outcome changes entirely, even if right. he does that. And it'd be hard to assume that the same outcomes would go on. So, yeah, I mean, Fulmer, I think that's the big one. Like, I, I'm sitting next to Ryan Herrera, and, like, you, you you see this moment, and you're like, if they can get out of it with one run given up, that's a win. And right. then strikeout, strikeout, strikeout. And I think it's really just like we we could talk more about this if if we want, but like Michael Fulmer, rough start with the Cubs this season. We know yeah. it. He was a guy you thought would be in that closer role, whatever de facto closer as the Cubs have kind of used guys. Struggled and he's been like rock solid yeah. since probably late May. And we could pull up the numbers, but that guy's been huge and and I think if you know, you're looking at the pitching staff and the different questions, like that guy has turned into a reliable piece. 
Yeah, he's been a, a huge piece, and, and we think about for I mean I, I think since twenty twenty one the Cubs have always seemingly always had a three headed monster, right? Whether it's Chafin, Tapera, and Kimbrel, or last year with Robertson, Givens, and and Martin. Uh, Martin. This year, I, I think you immediately think your three headed monster is Lighter, Merriweather, and Adbert, which rightfully so it is. That's clearly who Ross has gone to in the seventh, eighth, and ninth. But Fulmer cannot be overlooked in that conversation. He's been really, really big for the Cubs in, in that sixth sixth inning role. And, and his slider, his his two seamer, those are really, really disgusting pitches. And, and I think it's really, really important to see that and, and to have that extra arm that you can go to in those situations. And, and Ross joked about it after the game, like. He's like he said. It's like it's comical, right? Like you can go to, you can kind of look at Fulmer and say, "Hey, all right, go get him," and you kind of have faith that he's going to strike those guys out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like he just knew, like the stuff is there that he can strike them out. And and Fulmer talked about it after the game that working with Tucker Barnhart, he's like, "Hey, what do you want to go with?" And they planned for it and they had it. And then there was kind of like a no. I don't. I don't know if you noticed. That. I caught it after the game. I don't know what it would have been ruled, right? But he had two strikeouts on six pitches. Then he did O2 count. So he's got. He's looking at an immaculate inning, but it's not really an immaculate inning, right? Like he didn't get it. He didn't get it right because he got he got ball uh, ball one on, on on Vaughn, I believe it was, and then he got another ball and then he struck him out. But that would have been an interesting like, is that an immaculate inning or is it not? Like it, it's kind of a question mark. The semantics neither here nor there. But that was that was a really really interesting situation to know that Ross trusted him to not only get the outs but to get it unscathed and, and like you mentioned they were the Cubs were clearly playing for that one run you go you give up one run maybe you get a double play and then you get the the next out and you're you're feeling pretty good about yourself best case scenario happened there with the three strikeouts another key moment for me in the game was the Nick Madrigal home run right he comes in and pitches for Tucker Barnhart and when Nick Madrigal is coming up to bat against Aaron Bummer your immediate thought is okay he's just going to get on base right like get a single maybe get a double if you're lucky like that's all it is and then he hits that ball I don't know about you, but my reaction's like, I think that's a fly out. And then you see Ben Intendi just keep going back and back. And I'm like, I think this is going out. And then he's going back some more. And I'm like, oh my God, this was going to go out. And then it went out into the basket. And that kind of changed the game. I, I thought it I thought it was a, a big moment. I thought just given with the top of the order coming up, like it, it could give the Cubs some spark. But Morrell had an interesting co- uh, comment after the game. He said, well, uh, Nick Madrigal will go coming in and hitting a home run. Once I saw that, I said to myself, this game is ours. Uh, wow. they, he knew like that, that was the, the turning point that magical home run was so huge. And, and the former strikeouts were huge and, and the morale home run was big, but it really all gets started with magical's home run in the, in the eighth inning. Yeah. I mean, like I, I turned to Ryan Herrera on the Cubs beat in that ball was in the air. And I said, could you imagine? Cause yeah. it looked like it, it looked like it was just going to be a deep fly out, but it kept right. going and going and going and, you know, respect to Nick Madrigal, but he had one home run this season, I think. In his time with the Cubs, he now has two total, right? right? So you don't expect that. Um, I think this moment, this is interesting to me. You think about that moment. Who did he pinch hit for? It's Tucker Barnhart, and why, right? Like, yeah. And then what, what I want to add to that is Jan Gomes pinch hit for Mike Talkman after Madrigal's home run, the very next batter. And you look at that and you're like, okay, maybe why wouldn't you just have Gomes pinch hit for the catcher and, and Madrigal for Talkman? Well, you're thinking. Madrigal ahead of Gomes because he can get on base for Gomes, knowing they're going to pinch hit, and then Gomes, right. you do you think is going to have this power supply, right? Uh, in theory, you could have just done it that way. You could have the catcher for the catcher, save yourself all the double switching and moves, right? Right, right, right. right. They didn't do that, and it, honestly, like that's that's the underrated aspect of all this yeah. move to me is they did it in that order, and it paid off in the way that you probably, if you had to predict, you would have guessed Jan Gomes hit the home run and Nick Madrigal. Would not have right, so yeah. I think that was that was an interesting aspect of it. Yeah, it was it was it was a key key at bat, key moment in the turning point of the game. Um, we're gonna take a quick commercial break, Tim. But when we come back, we're gonna talk. I mean, there was the Morel home run kind of stole the spotlight, but the big news was Marcus Stroman and, and his injury. We're gonna come back. We're gonna talk about it. Talk about what it means for the Cubs right after a quick break from our sponsor. We know you love Chicago. You devour the pizza, admire Chicago skyline, and cheer on Chicago sports teams, especially the Cubs. If you wanted to live in a more boring place, you'd live in St. Louis. Why not bank with Chicago's bank too? Upgrade your wallet with an exclusive Wintrust Cubs debit card, which you can get when you open a Wintrust Cubs checking account. Show your Cubs pride and open an account at Wintrust.com slash Cubs. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. Welcome back into the Cubs Weekly Podcast. Andy Martinez here with Tim Stevens. Tim, we were we mentioned a little bit before the break, but the the big news before the Morel home run on, on Wednesday night, 
was uh, Marcus Stroman um, suffering a right rib cartilage fracture. I had to make sure I got that right. That was kind of a mouthful. Cubs were really unsure how it kind of happened, and there's this isn't like a this isn't like a strained forearm or a, you know, a shoulder inflammation type of thing that you kind of have a general gait. This is a very very unique injury, and the the Cubs are kind of don't know how it exactly happened and and what that kind of timetable looks like for Marcus Stroman. Well, for pitchers especially, that's the point, right? Like yeah. it's it's maybe something that you think of rib cartilage and that's on your side. You can kind of think maybe it's a hitter swinging. Or Maybe. like, or like a hit, ba- like you get hit by a ball, like you get hit by a pitch, or like you take a funny grounder, that kind of thing, or you yeah. run into someone on the bases. Like, yes, it's more. It would be more common, I guess, for a, for a position player. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the bottom line. So that when your pitcher gets it, and and what do they say, right? Like it was he threw a bullpen Sunday, and he started feeling this discomfort later in the day, and then he gets an MRI, and it's not just discomfort; it's this kind of unique injury. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's. I think I was surprised to see that news today, and I don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to get too ahead of yourself, but you kind of consider that he was already out for a bit uh, on the injury list for you know, over two weeks at this point. This was supposed to be the day he came back to start, and you kind of start looking at the calendar and, and what it could mean for his season, at yeah. least his regular season, if this team makes the playoffs. And that that was my first reaction. I hate to look that far ahead, but we're at that time of year now where uh, what is next now? Yeah, and it's it's a fair argument because we are we're running out of games, right? I believe it's forty two games after after Wednesday night are, are left in the season, and David Ross was asked before the game, "Do you kind of have to plan as if he's not coming back?" And he had a, a great answer where he equated it to guys like Nick Birdie and Brad Boxberger, right? They're on their own timeline and then they're getting healthy, and you hope that they can come back before the season, but you kind of have to go without them, right? You kind of have to piece. In their case, you have to piece their bullpen together. In this case, you have to piece your rotation together. And it's an interesting thing because Ross was asked about it pregame. There's been a lot of situations throughout the season. Like you, you think about the rotation before the year. Kyle Hendricks is hurt and is not on the rotation. Hayden Wozneski struggles. Jamison Tyon, your big, big free agent signing, starts the year, really, really struggles. Whole first half. Ma- uh, Marcus Stroman and Justin Steele really, really stepped up and, and pitched really, really well. Drew Smiley was really, really good for the first two months of the season. That kind of carried you. Then when Drew Smiley started struggling and then when Marcus Stroman started struggling before the injury, Jamison Tyone kind of really picked it up. Kyle Hendricks kind of got back on form. He was able to figure it out. As of late, Javier Saad has been the guy that's kind of stepped in and has been really, really good. And he started in place of Stroman on Wednesday, went six innings through, had a quality start, kept the kept the Cubs in the ball game. Like, the it's weird to say, but it seems like every time they've had some sort of adversity, they, there's been someone that stepped up. Ross credited his the depth and the roster construction where, where they have that. Think about Bellinger when Bellinger went down. That kind of brought Mike. That no, that not, not kind of it brought Mike Talkman on the roster. Look what he's become. Like these situations have come up and and things have kind of worked out. Miles Mastroboni was really good for them a couple weeks when when Nick Madrigal was down. Like it's it seems like every time something kind of some sort of adversity comes in the form of injury or, or underperformance, they've had someone step up. Yeah, I mean, I think with the rotation specifically, this is just something that they didn't have this They didn't have this depth last year, plain and simple. Yeah. I mean, early no, in the season, um, Marcus Stroman goes down, Wade Miley goes down at different points, but kind of all in the same window. Drew Smiley goes down, yeah. and eventually Kyle Hendricks. They did not have the depth, plain yeah. and simple. And when you looked at what that team what had to go right, you needed some of those guys – to, to be contributors and, and go down and unfortunately and I think that was part of what hurt their season and led to them eventually selling pieces of the deadline it's been the opposite this year they've yeah. had a lot of pieces to be able to step in and, and the starting rotation aside with Snesky, um and then like we're saying the, the different additions they had um, that the last year it just was not there um, I do think it's interesting that we talk about this because like they've been on this incredible run, um, and Marcus Stroman, he was he was healthy for a, he's been healthy for a chunk of this run. But right. as you kind of said, like he was struggling. Um, I think as they were kind of getting loaded up here, they were they were getting moved this upward momentum, and then he went out, and they've, they've kind of kept this momentum going. And I think at the end of the day, you want this guy on your staff, yeah. healthy for what you're looking to accomplish down the stretch and beyond into into October, but. It's, it's a weird situation where it's like you hope that you have 
you think you have pieces to to weather it in the same time and that's yeah. just it's a weird catch 22 i guess i don't know yeah yeah it's 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 definitely a weird situation and it creates it doesn't really create a hole on the roster right because like you mentioned he was on the injured list the, his injury right now directly does not force a roster move like they don't have to call someone up they just they don't have to bring bring someone on the 40 like none of that has to happen right he, he was not on the roster he was injured on the injured list so like from a purely roster construction point like nothing changes and from a rotation standpoint in the immediacy nothing changes right because of all the days off and the way his il stint was was timed out essentially uh timed out's not a right word like you don't plan on when you're going to get injured but like the way it was uh, it worked out was he was really only missing like a start or two yeah. just given the, all the days off and everything and so they were able to move smiley into the bullpen amidst his struggles which served us two purposes right kind of get him back on track try to figure out his th- uh, what was what was going wrong also gives ross a, a left-handed option in the bullpen which he had not had after they optioned anthony k to the bullpen you do that and, and that kind of solves some things with that with that that meant your rotation was justin Steele, jameson tyone kyle hendricks and then they moved javier Assad, who i think is clearly now in the rotation going forward with the way he's going. But now that all those days off are kind of passed after Thursday's day off, what does the fifth spot in the rotation look like? And David Ross pregame on Wednesday said it's, it's, he's leaning towards Drew Smiley. And I, it, it's a great debate, right? Was it, was Nesky or was it Smiley? Both have struggled at various points in the season. I think you go with Smiley more on the veteran experience, just given he's, he, I mean, he was on the 2021 Braves he pitched in, he's pitching big moments. He's kind of gone through a full season where he knows like the ups and downs. You kind of have faith in that mentality that he can go out there and, and give you some some length. Hayden Wisniewski's really really struggled against lefties, right? I think I think it's a uh, over in a thousand OPS against against lefties. Like that's not going to be good enough in a playoff push as a starter. You need someone that can get both sides out. And as much as you want Hayden Wisniewski to 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 do that i think the best situation for him and the cubs right now is to be in a longer relief role kind of like we saw with the side where he can kind of right the ship and and figure things out and then maybe you can talk about him going into the rotation well you know what's kind of funny about it and it's not funny at all for the cubs i'm just using that term here ironic yeah whatever (laughs) (laughs) like look like this scenario if like Drew Smiley is a left-handed pitcher struggling against lefties. Like that's right. not ideal, right? right? You 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 would hope that that would be if you if you're gonna struggle against anyone, have it be the opposite split. Right. Uh, they don't even have the option to have them piggyback each other. If that was potentially something right. that would because interest them, because it's it's compounding the struggles. Yeah, like you said, Wisniewski against lefties, one thousand thirty-two OPS, one point oh three two. Yep. Smiley, nine seventy-four, and it's like, what do you do then? And yeah. in in people, I think I you see the reactions on Twitter and. Uh, or sorry, X, the, the platform formerly yes. known as Twitter. Uh, <laughs> they're saying like, oh, I would like to see Wisniewski. And it's like, Wisniewski, I, I don't know what the best way to use him is. Like, it's tough when you're a young pitcher and you're kind of just getting mop-up duty and, and you think you think he can contribute more than just stretched out and starting in Iowa. Like, you think there's a place for him. But if, if the lefty thing is such an issue that you don't really trust him to start right now, then, then like you're saying, you go with the guy who's the veteran and trust the track record of a veteran and, hope that he figures it out and, and maybe that he's more likely to figure it out but I think if you just looked at the numbers on paper and, and the track nothing the track just how they've been going for an extended period here now like Smiley in the rotation with out of the bullpen like they've, they've both been going through their ups and downs their struggles right so I'm, I'm with you where I, I think the Smiley thing makes sense but like I don't know how it's going to work out. That's for sure. Yeah. I don't know I don't know exactly how much they need though either it's it's you're talking about a fifth starter every fifth day to give you just four or five innings and you have this bullpen that's been so so good just get it to them and with the team in the game yeah and and it's interesting that on i believe it was tuesday before tuesday's game yeah they recalled michael rucker and option caleb killian michael rucker was kind of stretched out kind of he pitched he was he started a couple games in iowa his last outing was three three innings 60 pitches so like you have him and now you have wesneski where like those guys can kind of give you some length for that fifth starter situation, right? Like if if you go with Smiler, even if you went with Wisniewski and they maybe only give you four innings or five innings, like you have that bridge gap to get you to your Merriweathers, your Lighters, your Adberts, your Fulmers, et cetera, et cetera. Like you kind of have that bridge built in. And having those long guys kind of covers you for 
it's probably un, it's not unrealistic to say that there's going to be some outings between now and the end of the year where one of the other four guys in the rotation don't give you length. So you're going to need those guys. It, it just creates a lot of it solves a lot of issues if you have Wesneski in the bullpen and you kind of tr- we saw flashes of what he could be last year and it, it, you trust that if he can kind of get back to that like we saw with Assad right Assad really struggled in that long relief role at the beginning of the season so much so that he was optioned was getting stretched back out as a starter like it was it seemed like it wasn't going to work and look where he's come now where he's he's clearly a piece of the rotation that's not unrealistic to say like that maybe could happen with Wesneski there's times running out so can't you can't necessarily guarantee that that's the case but it's also not unrealistic. Like that, that is a, a a scenario that could play out and could kind of maybe solve some of the issues in the rotation. Yeah, and remember too, it's not the same as it once was when you had way too many people in one dugout in right. terms of spacing. But like I'm talking about September call ups, there's not yeah. going to be 40 guys in your dugout. You're like, calling up one pitcher in September. One 1st. more pitcher. So in terms of if you need it, if you need to keep the bullpen, that's going to help keep the bullpen fresh. I'm not going to say all alone it's going to, but that can right. help if you do have to use the bullpen. I do want to talk more a little bit about the Stroman specifically and like why we're yeah. saying, why we're even sitting here saying the idea that may, who knows, like they don't know. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves because for all we know, maybe it's something that he bounces back quickly from. But like we're saying, we're talking about the possibility of missing the rest of the regular season because he's been down for over two weeks at this point, right? Yep. And if you want to say like, I'm not a doctor, right? I'm, I'm no doctor. Right. Did you know that? I'm I, no doctor. I'm shocked to hear this. If you if you wanted to speculate, like, let's just throw numbers out. Like, if he were to miss two weeks because of this, so that's been a month. It's not just that he's missed, he's he's out a month. Like, you have to ramp back up right. after exactly. being out a month. You and, can't just go out there and throw 100 pitches after sitting out a month. Right. So I'm optimistically saying, like, if he were, you know, because did not the Cubs, the Cubs did not say, did they not say that they wanted to be symptom free before he does anything, right? right? So let's say symptom free in two weeks. Like then you're looking at September first around there. Uh, and it, it takes a few weeks to ramp up. Hundred percent. And like, at that point, you're just like, what do you what do you want from him? That's going to be the big question. Like, do you want him to come back and be a guy who gives you three, or are you looking to ramp him up? Hope you make the playoffs, make that push, secure a spot without him, and bring him back for a game one. If that in that scenario. But again, like then you're talking about a guy who hasn't pitched in two months pitching in a game one of a playoff situation or maybe game two if you go with steel game one and that's me saying if he's symptom free in two weeks we just don't right. know like jed said and, and rossi like you don't know when he's you don't know when, this we is don't such know a unique about injury it. this is not like a like we mentioned at the at the beginning talking about this this is not a shoulder inflammation this is not elbow tightness this is not oblique tightness like this is this is such a one-off that you can't really just say september 21st that's when Strowman will be back and he'll be starting that day. Like, you just cannot say that. And correct me if I'm wrong, you said this before. Like, they, Ross kind of equated it to Birdie and Boxberger. Like, if yeah. we don't know when they come back, like, great when they do to see what they can contribute, right? Right. I think kind of intrinsic in that is you, you're not counting on them to come back. It's just, it's not in a when, it's more of an if. And it's a hopeful if. Right. Like, you hope they do, but it's still an if. And I think Strowman's kind of similar in this situation where it's like, you don't know. When right. or if or or what it's gonna look like, and that's why we're saying like, you know, the next six weeks, man, like, what where where he is by the time the season ends. Yeah, it's it's a really really interesting situation and, and a precarious situation, and like we mentioned, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out for the Cubs, just given what they've kind of done throughout this this season. They've never it feels like they've not once been fully healthy, right? Like to have their full roster, and yet they're still in a division race. They're still in a wild card race. They're still in a position to, to be playing comp- competitive games in September to give themselves a shot to play in October, which I think is a testament to, to the players and what they've done, which is which is really really impressive. Um, Tim, thank you so much for joining the podcast. It's been it's been a fun one. It was it was action packed. There was a lot going on, and it, it, it was a, it was a lot of fun to to do this one after a, a fun game like that. Adrenaline's high in Wrigleyville, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it for this edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust. Don't forget to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and check us out in video form on the Marquee Sports Network app and YouTube.